Hey there, how have you been? I'm so glad to see you here on my YouTube talks. It's been a while since we've talked, so thank you so much for your patience while I have been researching and making my fact-based video. I wanted to make sure that I provided you with the best and most current information that's available. Speaking of information, have you heard the news lately? As of 2023, scientists have confirmed the colors of the ocean are changing into deeper greens and blues at the poles. But don't get the wrong idea here. This isn't just a pretty color of the ocean to look at. It symbolizes a much deeper meaning. The ocean is running out of fuel. I like to think of phytoplankton like the gas of the ocean. Let me explain. Just like your car doesn't run without fuel, the ocean life cannot run without phytoplankton. These microscopic organisms are the food source that floats at the top of the ocean water, similar to food at the top of a fish tank. Phytoplankton are the primary producers that convert sunlight into energy through photosynthesis. You remember photosynthesis in grade school, right? It was taught as the process that is essential for life on Earth. It provides the oxygen we breathe, and it is the foundation of the food chain. These are some of the reasons I like to call phytoplankton the fuel of the ocean. But let's keep in mind that's not all they do. According to science.org, the ocean absorbs 40% of the CO2 that humans emit. Phytoplankton in turn converts that CO2 into oxygen or dye, and it gets buried at the bottom of the ocean. In other words, they help regulate Earth's climate and carbon balance. So, phytoplankton has been declining at an alarming rate. Scientists claim at about 40% since 1950. So what does all this mean for you and me? The ocean's shades of green and blue are gorgeous and calming to the naked eye. A peaceful stretch of waves might look serene, but for marine life, those colors tells a deeper story. The ocean color is a reflection of its health. That deep, clear blue we often admire, it actually signals low biological activity or very little phytoplankton and fewer nutrients. On the other hand, green-tinted waters are rich in chlorophyll, the pigment in phytoplankton, and it's indicating thriving ecosystems full of microscopic life. It's a bit like your backyard pool. A sparkling blue pool is clean and lifeless which is great for swimming, but not much else lives in it. A murky green pool, though, unpleasant to swim in, is teeming with algae and microorganisms in the ocean. That green isn't just a sign of neglect. It's a sign of life. The ocean is changing color, and that's a red flag. Scientists have confirmed that over half of the world's oceans are shifting to deeper blues and different greens signaling major disruptions in the marine ecosystems. Bluer waters mean fewer phytoplankton, those microscopic organisms that fuel the ocean's web and help regulate Earth's climate. These color changes aren't just cosmetic. They are a warning that the ocean's balance is breaking down. So when you hear the scientists say that the oceans are changing colors and they are concerned, these changes could be bad for the marine ecosystem. California's commercial salmon fishing has been shut down for three years now. And according to NOAA Fisheries, the root of the problem starts with low phytoplankton levels. As ocean conditions shifted, phytoplankton populations declined, disrupting the food web and leading to a surge in anchovies. Salmon were forced to rely on these anchovies, and then they developed a thiamine or vitamin B1 deficiency, killing up to 50% of newly hatched Chinook salmon in the Sacramento River between 2020 and 2021. This is a clear example of a chain reaction showing how even tiny changes at the base of the ocean's food system 
can trigger massive consequences for marine life and coastal economies, affecting fish diets, nutrition, and survival. Sarah Bates, who is a commercial fisher based in San Francisco, said it continues to be devastating. Salmon has been the cornerstone of many of our ports for a long time. Just imagine giant underwater bulldozers scraping the ocean floor. That's essentially what deep sea dredging looks like. A destructive hunt for valuable minerals like nickel, cobalt, and rare earth elements, which countries like Russia and China are aggressively pursuing. But this industrial scale mining doesn't just scar the seabed. It threatens to unravel delicate marine ecosystems. As dredging stirs up ancient sediments, it can release long trapped carbon back into the water and the atmosphere, weakening the ocean's ability to store carbon and regulate climate. Even more alarming, the sediment clouds reduce sunlight and disrupt nutrient flows, the conditions that phytoplankton, the ocean's microscopic powerhouses, depend on to survive. Since phytoplankton is the fuel of the ocean, their decline could trigger cascading effects on fish populations, marine mammals, and coastal economies. Scientists warn that the damage from seabed mining could be both profound and irreversible. What's more, plastic and chemical pollution are silently suffocating our oceans. Every year, an estimated 14 million tons of plastic enter the ocean. And by 2025, between 75 to 199 million tons of plastic waste are expected to be floating in marine environments. But the problem goes far beyond floating bottles and bags. Microplastics are those tiny fragments formed as plastics, break down, and they have infiltrated every layer of the ocean, from the surface to the seafloor. These particles are not just unsightly, they are deadly. Some marine animals mistake them for food, leading to internal injuries, starvation, and even death. Over 100 million marine animals die each year due to plastic pollution. What's even more alarming, microplastics are disrupting the ocean's biochemistry, meaning the delicate balance of biological, chemical, and geological processes that regulate climate and sustain life. As plastics degrade, they release toxic chemicals that interfere with phytoplankton growth, nutrient cycling, and oxygen production. In short, plastic pollution isn't just a litter problem, it's a full-blown ecological crisis that threatens the very systems that keep our planet alive. With the ocean under pressure from climate change, pollution, and industrial exploitation, investing in sustainable fisheries isn't just about catching fish. It's about protecting the ocean's natural balance. Healthy fisheries depend on healthy ecosystems, and in turn, they support food security, coastal economies, and biodiversity, which is the variety of life. In a world where the ocean is running out of fuel, fisheries can be part of the solution, if managed wisely. So why should you invest in fisheries? Investing in fisheries, particularly sustainable private aquaculture, is no longer just a niche opportunity. This is a $1.5 trillion investment opportunity projected to generate up to 22 million new jobs by 2050. Aquaculture is now the fastest growing food production sector, supplying nearly 60% of the world's seafood. As wild fish stocks reach their limits, demand for responsibly farmed seafood continues to rise, offering strong, long-term returns for investors. But the return on investment isn't just financial. 
sustainable fisheries help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, support biodiversity, and provide a reliable source of protein for billions of people. According to the FAO, or Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, integrating aquatic foods into food systems is critical for global food security, climate resilience, and environmental sustainability. In short, investing in fisheries means investing in profit, people, and the planet, making this a triple win. So how can you get started? Well, private aquaculture means raising fish in tanks, ponds, or even ocean cages. This gives you full control on year-round production, scalable growth, and predictable returns. First, you will need to choose profitable species. Catfish is a no-brainer for affordability and domestic demand. It's low cost and great for warm climates like the southern United States. Cod brings in high returns. It sells for around $10 a pound, but it only costs about $2 per pound to produce. Also, if you're thinking about high-end markets, salmon is the gold standard. It's globally in demand, highly profitable, and consumers trust it, especially when it's labeled as sustainably farmed. Next, where you build matters. Location drives success. You want clean water, a stable climate, and access to buyers. In the United States, Florida is ideal for warm water species. Alaska's cold waters are perfect for salmon or cod. Maine offers great conditions for both freshwater and saltwater farming too. Internationally, leaders like Norway, Chile, and Japan are showing what's possible with strong infrastructure and government support. Just remember, every region has its own licensing, so please do your own research on it. Third, before breaking ground, you will need to build yourself a business plan. This means budgeting for infrastructure, species selection, water and waste management systems, and marketing. A small-scale fishery can start at around 50,000 or so, but this will really depend on size and the setup that you choose. For funding, you should not just be relying on your own wallet. Look into grants from the NOAA or state-level sustainability programs. And if you're pitching to investors, just lean into the environmental angle. It's a hook that pays off. Now let's talk red tape. With running an aquaculture farm, you will likely need water use permits, waste discharge authorization, and animal welfare certifications. This process can feel like a headache, but working with local aquaculture extension offices or fishery management councils can save you some serious time and trouble. You will need the right tools for the job. It will be necessary to invest in tanks, cages, filtration systems, and automated feeding technology. Then you will need your fish stock. It's called fingerlings, and make sure to get it from certified hatcheries to guarantee strong genetics and avoid diseases. Fingerlings are young fish, and just like they sound, the size of a human finger. They're usually a few weeks to a few months old and are ready to be transferred into grow out tanks or ponds. Think of them as the seedlings of the fish farming world, small but full of potential. And yes, sustainability matters. Certifications like ASC or MSC are not just environmental gold stars. They are ticket passes to premium buyers. Now, who's gonna buy your fish? There are several options, including wholesale to restaurants, seafood markets, and grocery chains. Or you can even go direct to consumer through local delivery or online platforms. And here is a bonus tip. Consider value-added products, such as smoked fish or flash frozen fish. They can bring higher margins and brand recognition. Lastly, once you're up and running, be sure to stay sharp. 
track everything, including fish health, feeding conversion ratios, water quality, and profits. Then use this data to refine your own system. And when you're ready to scale, look at adding more species, expanding your site, or even using a recirculating aquaculture system for even higher sustainability and control. A recirculating aquaculture system, or also known as RAS, is a high-tech fish farming setup where water is continuously filtered and then reused. Instead of constantly pumping in new water, the system cleans and recycles it. It's kind of like a giant aquarium with a built-in life support system. It's more sustainable, uses less water, and gives you more control over fish health and growth. So, phytoplankton is the fuel of the ocean. But as ocean temperatures rise, phytoplankton levels drop, which leads to less oxygen, more CO2 in the atmosphere, and a disrupted food chain. What will happen when the ocean runs out of fuel? More than 1 billion people worldwide rely on food from the ocean as their primary source of protein. The science is clear. The stakes are high, and the path forward is undeniable. Restoring the health of our oceans is not just the right thing to do, it's the only thing to do.